questions and stuff. So, so yeah, give him a rough ride. Really, really, <laughs> really, really grilling on what, what Mike's going to talk about. Um, so, yeah, thanks, James. Cheers. Cheers. Well, thank you for uh, James for asking me to come up as well because it's a uh, pleasure to get to speak to some people who are interested in the field that, that, that we're working in. Um, we're this presentation is looking at what we do to hopefully take our kids at our school from a child to a potential champion. Now, there's no guarantee that those things are going to happen. There's lots of things that come into it with uh, an athlete being successful, but we're trying to give them the best possible start on that pathway. Um, I came into strength and conditioning because I missed certain stages in my development that I think now we know a lot more about so the physical development I was a lot further behind some other players um, at the same age at 17 18 that had a different athletic development pathway if you like before I got there so that my motivation has always been to work with younger athletes um, I've spent the last six years working with young athletes um, from from a range of sports range of backgrounds um, I finished my degree in 2006, but had a couple of years before I decided to really pursue SNC as a career. Um, and then it was 2009 I started working with some junior tennis academy players, um, which followed on uh, an SNC internship at Bristol Rugby, again working with Academy University. Um, and then late in 2010 I started working full time with a company called The Athlete Academy, which is based in Gloucester, um, working in schools and delivering long-term athlete development programs to, to a number of schools. And I think by sort of mid-2011, we had about eight schools that we were working with and, and, and delivering weekly programs and, and athletic development sessions. I left there in late 2011 and set up my own company, which is Proformance Strength and Conditioning. Um, again, working on a similar line, working with young athletes, and particularly we focused on running uh, high-level rugby camps, targeting players in this area, which is obviously a big rugby area, um, we were looking to provide them with the, the strength and conditioning side to support their, their progress. Um, and then a, couple of, a year or so later, uh, an opportunity presented itself to, to, to train as a PE teacher. Um, and this is kind of a, I guess, a long route into, in, into getting what, what I wanted, which was more time working with young athletes. I'd seen the PE uh, department, I'd seen the way that they worked, I could understand the time that they had available to work with these kids. But I could see also that they weren't doing everything that they needed to do to make these children better athletes. A lot of sports specific work, but there wasn't a lot being done in terms of high quality strength and conditioning or athletic development at a basic level. So. I saw the opportunity, I spoke to the head of PE at the school where I trained, which is St Peter's, and I'm there full time now, and, and we basically discussed this idea of what we could build, and, and here we are now, 18 months on, um, with, with, with what is fast becoming a very, very big programme. So, the Elite Performance Pathway, this is, this is, what, this is our <coughs> development model, this is something that we've built. Um, and it carries the kids from, from the point where they come in at key stage three, at 11 years old, right through the school, up to the age of 18. So it's a seven year pathway, should they stick with it all the way. Now we're into the second year, so we've got kids now who joined at different, different ages. So we had some who started last year in year seven or in year eight, we had some in year 10, year 11, and, and I'll show you some different things that we're doing with those groups. Um, it runs parallel to what we do in curricular PE um, and the extracurricular sports side. As a school, we're, we're, we're very focused on, on performing well in sport. We've produced a number of international rugby players over the years. Um, at junior level, we've had um, Charlie Sharples, who's played England rugby. He was a student at our school. Um, and we've built this program now to, to hopefully produce more players like that. Uh, it's built on the latest research, some of which that we are referred to throughout the, the, the lecture. Um, and we're focusing on improving, obviously, their physical performance, but it, it's broader than that because it takes more than that for an athlete to really succeed. And the other thing is, is that some of these children that we're working with now won't become a professional athlete, but we want them to be 
good people in the long run and, and able to perform in any environment. The team that we've constructed now over the last 18 months, uh, Stuart Crabbs, the head of PE, he's the, the person who kind of created the space, if you like, in our, in our timetable, in our curriculum for us to be able to run with this project. Um, had he not done that, there's no way we'd have been where we are today. When I came into the, the teaching, I thought it was going to take us between sort of three and five years to get to the point that we've got to now, but it, we've actually done it in about 18 months. Um, all the PE staff, though, they do contribute. They put up with me talking about this all the time and trying to get them to, to do things and, and get, tell me what kids need to be on it, how kids are performing. Um, we've also brought in two master's students who are sports psychologists that are providing psychological support sessions for our young athletes to, to complement what we're doing from a physical perspective. Um, and we've now, well, just today, we just confirmed um, four interns that will be joining the programme. Two have been with us already, two who have um, just joined today and will start after Easter. So we're up to a coaching team of five on the ground in the SNC sessions, plus the support that we get from the Union of Gloucestershire. So it's growing. Aims of the programme, we want our athletes to be intelligent. We want them to be able to make good decisions in terms of their training, in terms of their lifestyle on the pitch and able to cope in all of those environments. Um, Self-discipline, physical and mental strength, as well as their social emotional um, development, having a good work ethic, getting things done that need to be done that they don't necessarily want to do sometimes, but generic skills that they can transition into another high performance environment, whether that's in the world of business, whether it's in sport, whether it's in education in another setting, whether it's at a university, a sports academy, whatever we want them to carry the work and ethic culture that we breed into those areas. We're trying to create a culture. It, it's more than just a strength and conditioning session. It was just a strength and conditioning session at the start of last year, but we've learned and we've evolved the programme. Uh, and this was something I picked up off, if you're not familiar with the website, Juggernaut Training um, Systems. This um, was something that Keith Power put on there. And it looks at all the components that make up a high performance environment. But what this is saying, this diagram is saying, is that none of it is driven that well without that culture. That big cog around the outside. It drives everything. It drives the way that people work in all of those situations. So you might... If you're only focusing on physical skills, which we were at the start of last year, you're only, you're only scratching the surface of everything that's required, particularly if they're going to transition into a high-performance environment in the long term. This is something we're working at constantly. It's something that, as the programme's evolved, we've realised wasn't quite as we needed it to be, so we needed to, we needed to address it. In terms of what we're providing, in terms of an education for the athletes, we're covering four key areas. Physical preparation was the first building block we put in place. We've now brought in the mental preparation. After Easter, we'll have some, some nutritional work. We're working with another department in the school where they'll be doing cooking lessons. We'll be going to supermarkets, looking at food that they should be sourcing, prepare, how to prepare it, recipes that they can use, things that are easy to cook, as well as managing their, their lifestyle as well, sleep, recovery how they manage their time with their studies. If they're gifted and talented athletes, they're often pulled from pillar to post in terms of the number of games that they have to play. We have some rugby players sometimes that we're battling with them playing up to three games in a week, two in a weekend sometimes, where, where there's competing um, parties trying to get them to play. Um, our model. This is what we have in place in the system at the moment. When they're at the school, we've got four, four levels. Athletic foundation, development, performance, and then peak. And the peak is, is a theoretical peak. This is by no means the peak of their athletic career, but it is where we want them to be at the highest point of their athletic powers when they leave us. But they are still very much developmental. Sports and Aptitude is our um, talent ID process that we have at year six, where we, we can select and admit 
um, a number of pupils into the school um, based on their sporting or should I say athletic ability. We can't select on sport ability, it has to be just their physical capacities that they show to be exceptional. So we can bring them in. If they come in through that pathway, they come straight onto this program. And we're hoping that as of September, that when they come in, they will actually get EPP sessioned in their timetable. That's what we're working towards currently. Um, other ways that they get in, they get selected based on their performances in extracurricular sport. They get brought in based on um, their work rate, their attitude. We have some perform very well in their sports, but they're, they're not the character. They don't have the they don't have the attitude. They don't have the work ethic that is expected, or they're not behaving around school. And we can't really promote those kind of behaviours, so we we don't bring them in, even if they are a high performer. Um, at this stage. Uh, this was uh, a model that I've adapted based from a paper by Ian Jeffries called the Quadrennial Plan for the High School Athlete. I've got the reference at the end. Uh, but he has a four stage model that he proposed for US high schools. Um, we've basically taken it and adapted it to work for UK school system. Um, but it's a good paper, worth having a read. It's got some good content. Where we're hoping that they get to is obviously professional sport, or we, we're, we're working hard at the moment to build links with Talent ID programs. We've got a couple of girls that we're trying to get in to GB weightlifting um, into their talent pathway for Tokyo 2020. Um, they're, gonna, they're, they're taking up some weightlifting coaching after Easter, and we'll be moving them towards um, some schools, competitions that will hopefully allow them to be spotted and developed. Uh, and we're always looking for, for those avenues. Also look at the university scholarships and high performance centres that we could send them out to. And we've also recently had um, someone from the American college system in to present about how they could potentially um, receive a scholarship and go over to the States, um, which is a phenomenal opportunity for some of them who want to pursue that. There's a young guy um, I used to work with, a tennis player at the moment, and he's on a scholarship in Chicago at the moment. And it, I think it's almost all paid for. Um, because of how good he was with his tennis, so he's, he's living the dream. Um, I think it costs him about half of what it costs to do a degree over here at the moment to be over there, and it's all paid, board and food and whatnot. So phenomenal if you can if you can get it. Hopefully, we can facilitate that. So for us, if they don't make professional sport, they might actually get a really good ride in in their education on a scholarship program, gain a degree that they may not have been able to afford any other way. So if, we, if that is an outcome that we get, as well as them being a good athlete and playing a good level of sport while they're there, you know, for us that's a, that's, that's a big win. So onto, onto a bit of the underpinning theory behind what we're actually doing and delivering. So you see the overall model, that the content then that goes on within each of those phases is driven by what we see within the youth physical development model that John Oliver and Roger Lloyd put together. Um, we use it to guide what we do. In terms of where we are, I don't know how clearly you can see it on the screen, but there is a red box that kind of highlights where we are. The, we're predominantly in the adolescence area. With the boys, we capture the last sort of year of middle childhood. Um, and we see them through, through to 18. If you're not familiar with the model, basically font size within it refers to importance. So the bigger it is, the more important it is. So at our age groups, what we're looking at is there is a big focus up to 16 with the boys on agility, speed, power and strength, as well as hypertrophy in those later years. Um, and a bit less emphasis on fundamental movement skills and mobility, but talk about maybe a couple of issues related to that in a bit. With the girls, slightly different. They mature a little bit earlier, so they're into adolescence already by the time that we catch them at secondary school and we get them at 11. Uh, but again, the, 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 the most important bits are, are fairly similar in the agility, speed, strength. Power are, are a big focus, along with, with hypertrophy and their sport-specific skills. As a PE teacher, it's, 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 it's been 
Very interesting going from being a strength and conditioning coach to being a PE teacher as well, where we're taking care of sports specific skills, but it has opened my eyes in a, in a big way because we now control a much larger proportion and we get to see them in many, many different environments, whether it's football, rugby, basketball, and we can see how what we're doing in the gym actually transfers onto the pitch, if it is transferring. So we, we get to see a much, much bigger picture. I've got some guys I've worked with privately who don't have any involvement with in terms of I don't get an opportunity to see them perform frequently and it's something now that I feel is missing so I, I'm, I'm taking the effort to go and to go and see see what they're doing from a sports specific perspective as well. We're working at the moment as well uh, and we're hoping to get there after Easter uh, getting down into some primary primary age groups. Um, what we're finding at the moment is that a lot of this which should have been taken care of at a younger age, the fundamental movement skills, the mobility, things just isn't in place when they get to us at 11. Um, there aren't that many specialist primary PE teachers. Um, there aren't that many people working in that environment at the moment. There are some, but not, not that many. So within each phase that we have within our, our model, we have a set of objectives and, and, and indicative content of what we would expect to be covering based on what we know those athletes are going to be like at that point in time. And then across the phases, that training content, the targets in terms of what we want them to be capable of, so for example, by the end of year 10, which is 14, 15, we'd be hoping that they're getting somewhere near body weight squatting uh, on back squat or a front squat. Following two years, we'd like to see that closer to sort of one and a half times body weight. Some of them get there sooner, some of them might not get there, but they're general sort of targets to give you an idea of how it progresses. Um, up to where we're hoping that they uh, peak with us, should I say. So in terms of the progressions across the system on those sort of four key areas that we're looking at, strength, agility, speed and power, this is, this is how we kind of work progressing. So I've just kind of summarised what's in those four big tables down into a single slide. So in terms of strength, we're moving from body weight to low load to heavy barbell work. In terms of agility, we look at establishing the patterns, uh, particularly with locomotive agility through sort of initiation movements, transition movements and actualisation movements. Uh, There's a great chapter by Ian Jeffries on developing agility in Rodney Lloyd's textbook, Youth Strength and Conditioning, which, which breaks down all those movements. We almost use it now like a checklist to say, have we got these movements in place? Has that athlete got that, that movement from that position? Across the years as well, it does develop, it, you know, predominantly we'll see closed skill-based work, block work, random work as we try and, and develop and set those movement patterns how we want them. We then begin to link them up before we put them in open and reactive situations uh, and more chaos-based training um, situations where it's completely random and reactive. But that's not to say that we exclusively do this at the bottom level and we exclusively do that at the top level. It is a case that we, we use bits of all of it particularly when it comes to engaging kids uh, and get them really enjoying what we're doing, a bit of chaos training, tag games, that kind of thing. It's brilliant to engage them. We can break it down, do a bit of closed work, address what the movement problems are, put them back in and see if they can apply it. In terms of speed, we cover linear acceleration, absolute speed in terms of technique. Um, a lot of that will improve as they get stronger as their power improves, as their reactive strength improves, that isn't uh, a straightforward thing to improve, but we certainly in the lower levels want them to understand the positions that we want them to be in, and we want to create, um, create the ability for them to get in there. Um, power training, we use a lot of jump training at the lower levels, it builds into sort of more reactive plyometric work, um, and I'm not, um, I'm not someone who says you have to do Olympic lifting, but with us and the time that we have available, we do have the time to be able to teach them if they've got the movement capabilities. 
Uh, there are other scenarios where you, know, you might not use that. And there are some athletes where we use alternatives, derivatives of those lifts, or things like barbell jump squats, trap bar jump squats, that sort of thing. Okay, I've got a little clip that I'll show you, and hopefully it loads up. Uh, so this is a, a clip of, of some different types of training that we do kind of a, across the entire pathway. So it kind of carries from the lower level, where we're working predominantly against body weight, right up through to where we're working with the six formers, the 17 year olds. So simple jumping type tasks, broad jump with a landing emphasis. Can they land? Can they hold the position? And you'll see from the three of them that are leading it that they're, they're very different. The lad at the front here is, um, is one of the stronger in that age group. Very good, very good athlete, very quick. Um, old school PE style stuff, get them up the rope. Can they climb it? Not many can, but brilliant in terms of just engaging them getting them into the system. Basic gymnastic work, sort of handstand progressions, that sort of thing. Just things that they enjoy, things that they're benefiting from, things that are targeting areas that are not particularly strong in, in the age group. Body weight work, big part of what we do in the beginning. These are actually an older group that have, have progressed and they now use that as their warm up. You can see why I've had to recruit four interns because we've got about 20 kids who work with us on a Wednesday afternoon. This is some of our closed pattern speed work, so just looking at uh, lateral movements. Different initiation movements, so a bit of a hip turn, get them racing one another. They love that, a bit competitive. And then, as we progress on, we're obviously into some more, some more bar bar work. So he's just learning the Olympic lifts. But the foundation is put in place before we bring this kind of work in. She's phenomenal for a 16-year-old girl. Um, strong as an ox. 1.4 body weight squat. Pretty impressive. I've seen her pull pull ups with 10 kilos hanging off her. Puts a lot of the boys to shame. She comes and does boys' PE on a Friday afternoon, destroys a lot of them. This is a key stage five, so that's the sixth form. Um, so we're into our sort of heavier barbell -bar work, complex work. We don't get a huge amount of time with them, so we have to program in a way that we get a lot of bang for our buck. We, we get a lot out of the session. Um, and we'll look at some jump progressions that we that we use. So that gives you a, a bit of a picture of how different it is from the beginning to through to the end. Okay. One of the things I think is important to, to kind of touch on um, is the model that we look at the YPD model, it's, it's a great guy, it's brilliant. And when I started working with young athletes, which was three, four years before that was written, there was the Bali model, but there wasn't anything, that, I don't think that's as, maybe as robust as, as that in terms of a clear guide of what you should be doing and, and when you should be doing it. So it's great. But, as I said, a lot of those building blocks that you want from, from middle childhood, with, with the way that it is at the moment in terms of modern lifestyles and the way primary PE is and, and the amount of time that they get exposed or you know, even kids that specialise too early. There's a big thing at the moment about early specialisation in sport and we are seeing it. We are seeing it. We've got kids who are, you know, kicking the football, they're brilliant, but they can. There's so many things they can't do. You know, basic movements, changes of direction, stopping because they don't have they don't have the basic movement patterns in place. So, and this is the big reason, the evolution of man. And this is where we are today with a lot of it. We are, this is the, the beast, the creature that we are, we, we are fixing. We're trying to put, we're trying to straighten him out, we're trying to extend him, we're trying to you know, deal with this position that he's been in. The kids that we're dealing with, if you think about it, how much time they spend sitting down, or have spent sitting down, 
They go to school at four. They sit down in the chair for the majority of the day. They go home, they play their Xboxes, they play their Playstations, they're sat down. Lots of them are not getting up. Lots of them are not moving. There are people that are, but even those boys that go and play their rugby and their football, they're still spending a lot of time in positions that are going to tighten them up. So the reality versus the model it is actually usually quite different. And probably with a lot of them, it's mobility that needs to be and flexibility that needs to be in the, the, big, the big font on that YPD model. So for me, I look at the individual and I'm looking at them and saying, what, what do they need now? Not does what does the model tell me that they need. Ultimately, we're going to try and get to where the model is in terms of agility, power, speed, strength. But a lot of the times, it's a lot different. I've been caught in this trap a few times. I've gone away, I've been to a conference, been to a course, I've seen it, been and worked with a coach, I've seen something they're doing, I think, oh, it's awesome. I need to go and do that, I need to work on that, I need to develop my skill set in terms of being able to deliver it. Look at that, it's a bit selfish from my perspective, when actually there was something that they really needed to do that would have got them a bit, a bit further along. And that's something I've seen in my own, you know, a couple of mistakes that I've made. But at the same time, sometimes the nice to do stuff is the stuff that gets you an engagement off an athlete and it buys you some time, it buys you some credit that you can then say to them, right, we're going to step this back and we're going to work on something at a slightly lower level. And because you've got that credit in the bank with them, they'll put up with you, making them do a, a pretty grim st stretching session, flexibility session, cutting it right down to the basics. Might be a conditioning session that they need to do. But, so sometimes the nice to do buys you a bit at the beginning, or it engages them. So one of the nice to do things that we did um, at the beginning of the year, we did, we did quite a lot of sprint based work, we had the timing lights out, the kids that were new into the programme, like, wow, you know, I'm this fast, you know, real competitive, and it got them engaged. But really what we needed to do was get to the need to do, which was get them moving better, get them fixing up some faulty patterns. So we do need to do the need to do, but we need to remember that they're kids and that they are, we need to engage them and we want them in for seven years. We don't want them to come to three sessions, just stretch in the first three sessions and go and tell the parents and say that was the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. Don't ever let me near James. Again, that was terrible. So we want them in. So we've got to balance the need to do and the nice to do. But the common issues that we see, and, and this is you know, across the board, when we first get them, is poor flexibility and mobility. They're relatively weak in most cases. Um, there are some exceptions to the rule. Um, pretty much, if you get a young athlete that has a gymnastics or a dance background, that is brilliant because they are pretty strong against their body weight. They are generally over the last six years you see someone coming in there phenomenal, you ask them what they do, they're a dancer or they've been in gymnastics at some point in their life. So my kids again signed up to gymnastics at the moment. Um, so, but in general, they're relatively weak. They are relatively weak. Um, poor pillar strength, so with the pillar, just referring to sort of from hip, trunk, shoulder, that, that central portion, generally they're all pretty unstable, some of them more so than others. But although we're looking at those problems and, and there's a lot wrong, that doesn't mean we can't train them. We've just got to find <coughs> what we can do. And, and I'm, I'm big on the can-do approach. What can we do with them right now? And sometimes what you can do with them fixes what they can't do. So it might be that their hip flexors are tight. and they, they can't squat, but they can get into a split squat position that when they're in the bottom, it opens up their hips. They, they become more dynamically flexible through the hip and it actually fixes up some of the patterns. You put them back in a squat and all of a sudden it looks a ton better. So the can-do approach is a big thing. Because we have problems with flexibility and mobility, we emphasise a full range of movement with the best technique that they possibly can at that point. And generally, we'll see that if you're emphasising that full range of movement, it gets better, it gets better. As you get them into that bottom range, the bottom of the squat, things start to release, things start to be these positions that they've possibly never been in. Um, 
So whilst we are focusing on what they, what they can do, there is also a component to the session that we are targeting flexibility in a, in a problem area. So it might be in the warm-up, it might be in the cool down, it might be between two strength exercises that we just get them doing something. So in some ways we're trying to hide it in the session so they don't know that we're actually making them do flexibility work that they hate. Um, and sometimes it stops them messing around as well because it gives them something to do. Uh, but there are cases, and, and, and I'm, I'm big on this, if there's something I can't fix, I'm sending them to a physio. Um, we'll write to the parents and we say, they need, they need, we need some information from someone who knows more than we do and can look at it at a much, much closer level. Uh, and, and as, you know, as developing professionals, I would definitely say, you know, knowing when to refer out is, a, is really important. Knowing when to let someone else come in and do the work. In general, this is, this, is, this is simplifying our approach right down even further. We need to get them mobile and flex enough, flexible enough to get down into positions that we need them in to get strong because strength is a massive foundation that we're building an athlete on. Because it impacts on so many of the other variables in terms of, in terms of the components of fitness. So we get them strong. Um, and in novice and weak athletes, that's the best thing that you can do because it impacts on power as well. We don't spend a huge amount of time on power with our young, our, our developing athletes. It's part of the programme but it's not a huge focus. They do a lot of jumping and things like that to make sure that they're functioning well. But we're primarily focusing on, on strength. Once they're strong, then we aim to get them powerful. When they can produce a high level of force, something that's worth really developing some power with, then that's when we go with that. So we've got uh, uh, the girls that uh, uh, Ben came down and he saw a couple of the girls and they were pretty, um, I think Ben was quite impressed with them as, uh, considering they're two 16 year old girls. They're hitting now 1.4 and a 1.6 body weight squat. So one of them, 90 kilo squat, 66 kilos. They're now at a point where they, they're producing force uh, at a level where we're thinking, right, we need to make this, you know, how quickly can they produce this now? The other thing is that we're seeing the transfer of that strength at the moment isn't coming out of the gym, so they're, they're strong. One of them it, it is, but the other isn't, so we've got to look at, you know, finding out why is that transfer not happening, we've got to look at changing it. Uh, in terms of our power development, we use a lot of jumping. Uh, we emphasise horizontal force production as well as vertical, so we're not just jumping at boxes, we're jumping forward, we're bounding, we're leaping, and that's something we'll take a look at. Um, as the horizontal force production has been seen now through some research, guys are jigging around, that it, it's a bigger component of, of being faster, um, certainly through the acceleration phase, than just vertical force alone. It's important to have both. So we're focusing on, on making sure we get enough horizontal work in there too. Uh, trying to develop stiffness through the system, higher levels of reactive strength is something that we're, we're working on at the moment, uh, and run fast. We've got to have an opportunity to run fast. Even if it's just three or four sprints in a week, that's enough for them to maintain their speed. Speed decays at a really quick rate. So within seven days, if you haven't run maximally, it's going to drop off. But when you're a team sport athlete, you don't want to be running masses of volume and carrying that fatigue. So we keep it quite short, um, but it's there at the moment. And as we get into the summer, when there's less, less things that they're involved in, we'll do a lot more maximal velocity work, which has got much higher stress to the system. Uh, and we're, we're trying to build a very broad vocabulary of movement skills. That's looking at that, those categories that were highlighted by Ian Jeffries, as well as other basic movements, sort of getting up off the floor, that kind of thing. So they're comfortable around. Uh, and when it comes to the programming, uh, I was lucky to spend a couple of days with Nick Grant, and he came down to run a workshop with me. I don't know if you're familiar with him. If not, check out some of the stuff he does. Um, spinning plates, and this was something that he talked about, and when you think about the YPD model, it is saying train all these things all the time. So 
when we spin plates, we might have a particular component of fitness that we are focusing on, but we don't forget that we've got other things that we're working to, to maintain or, or develop. So we're not forgetting about them. We don't solely just go with speed. We don't solely just go with strength. There's a bit of it through different parts of, of the program. It might just be a small thread that runs through, but it keeps them competent in, in, in that. We saw it, um, we did a big phase on, on linear acceleration. We saw some big improvements in terms of 10 meter sprint time. Um, we then went into a block of work where we did a lot of agility work. We went back to test and we'd seen the 10 meter speed times drop off. And then we thought about it, actually, we haven't done any flat out sprinting for sort of two or three weeks. And, and the impact was that the times had dipped. So when you're programming, you think of spinning plates, what's the, what's the thing that you need to do? But don't forget that you've got some other stuff that you need to develop. Okay, uh, resistance training forms a big part of what we do. There's a lot of research out there now that I'm not going to get into too much because there's, there's plenty of it that you'll probably read in your own time. Um, but resistance training has been shown to improve a lot, a lot of things for the athletes at a young age. Strength, power, their speed, agility, body composition, um, also beyond the sort of physical develops their confidence, they feel better, they're more, more confident in their bodies. Um, and this is again something from Rodney Lloyd's textbook, The Athletic Motor Skill Competencies. So this is looking at, you've got your fundamental movement skills, locomotion, stabilisation and manipulation, sort of throwing objects and things like that. But these are skills that we need, or movements that we need to be able to execute in order to train, to get strong to be able to produce a high amount of force that we can then apply within our sports. So the major categories, lower body bilateral, upper body pushing, upper body pulling, both vertically and horizontally, so your pull-ups, your overhead presses, your core work, your anti-rotation, your bracing, uh, jumping, landing, rebounding, throwing, catching, grasping, acceleration, deceleration, and then your lower body unilateral work, your one leg squats, your lunges, that sort of thing. So I sat down last summer, I'd been at the UPSCA conference, um, I'd listened to a few things on youth training, I'd been reading this at the time and it was, it was fresh in my mind and I was trying to work out what I could do with it, um, and I watched a presentation by John Noonan, a guy who worked at the IS, GB Sport, uh, GB uh, Ski and Snowboard, um, and he presented this idea of a, of, a, of a matrix of movement, and I thought, that's great, I, think, I thought we could use that. So, we took these categories and we created, or I created a, uh, a, a training matrix that corresponds with all of those categories that we need to train a young athlete with. So the levels progress, we go from sort of body weight up to, in this phase we're looking at the more complex heavy barbell stuff or, or things where we're working on a single leg, uh, right down to the basic body weight stuff, prison squats, simple bridges, split squats press-ups on an incline, band-assisted pull-ups. And then this is a kind of pathway now that we kind of follow. It isn't by any means the only pathway. It isn't to say that with every athlete you will go from level one, two, three, four, and five. You, you will find things that certain athletes fit better than others. Some athletes, you know, you'll be able to get them to overhead squat before they can front squat. Or back squat will not be an option for them for some reason. So you, you end up moving around a little bit, but it gives you a bit of a framework in terms of progressions and regressions. Uh, and there will be regressions when they grow and their movement changes, their flexibility goes at some point. So you do sometimes have to take a step back. But this is just something I use uh, as much as anything for my own mind when it's getting busy and a bit scatty to keep it clear um, and sort of reframe what I'm thinking about. Um, if you haven't read the UKSCA position statement on resistance training, um, it's definitely worth a read. It's got a lot of that basic research in um, on resistance training, but it's also got some great stuff like this guideline about what we should use in terms of sets and rep schemes, um, repetition velocities, rest intervals, that kind of thing. So very useful. Um, we follow it and, and kind of progress. So from sort of higher rep ranges, 10 down to 2s and 5s as their 
beginner, intermediate, etc. Similarly, with resistance training, we've got jump training matrix. And again, a lot of this was based around the fact that seen some stuff about the importance of horizontal work, um, multi directional jumps, uh, reactive jumping. Um, some guys I, I, I've read quite a lot by uh, Mike Boyle, Lee Taft, um, those guys promoting a lot of this, this jump based work and jump based progression. So we'll get down and, and do a bit when we get, we get practical. A um, bit of a case study for you just to see the sorts of impacts that you can have with young athletes when, when, when you get the opportunity to work with them consistently. This was a young 16 year old rugby player, so he was 14 when he came into the programme, which was September 2013. Um, couldn't do a bodyweight squat with decent technique, so we fixed him up. 18 months later, you can safely say he can squat 115 <coughs> kilos at 62 body weight. Massive increase in terms of his jumps. Oh, nearly, well, yeah over 20 centimetres, 26 centimetre increase in his jump height in that time. 10 minutes sprint time down from 1.9 then to 1.62. So um, he's, he, he's a pretty impressive specimen. Um, but he started at body weight, started doing body weight movements, got stronger, got stronger. We allowed him to progress onto the barbell and he just took to it. Good. Very good. Um, there's the references that I talked about in terms of um, Ian Jeffrey's paper, which is well worth a read. His model is very good, it gives you a very objective based uh, model based on what you should be doing and when, um, based on those ages within, a, within the high school, which his paper relates to sort of from year nine. <coughs> in our school system up to the end of sixth form. I think that's where, where high school kind of falls. Um, the youth uh, physical development model, Rodney Lloyds from the Strength Conditioning Journal and um, the position statement, which is pretty readily available online in PDF format. You can get your hands on that quite easily. And I think the quadrennial plan one is, um, is possibly there too, as well as that one. So it's all there readily available. So. That's a, a, a bit of a whistle stop tour in terms of what, what we're doing, how we're working, and the common things that we see. Um, we can get go down and do a bit of practical work if that if that suits, suits yeah. you guys. <coughs> yeah. um, does anyone have any questions yeah, about any of that? Um, you know, the PSA guidelines, the beginner, intermediate, advanced. How do you define what is beginner, intermediate, and advanced? That is. That is a good question, and it's still a question in my mind at the moment that I'm I'm still trying to get an answer from. Um, I've started to use a something by Dan Baker now to kind of decide when someone is ready to go from barbell. He's got it's published in 2007. Body weight simply did for the ASCA, the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association, um, and he gives you like. Uh, a quite a clear model in terms of how many reps an athlete should be able to do and they get a number of points if they can do say you know if you can do I think it's 40 squats or something in 60 seconds then you're ready to you'll score five points and then there's pull-ups and single leg squats if you can do five single leg squats you get five points and if you amass over 18 points in this system what they're saying is you're probably ready to progress to, to some barbell work. Um, and then I tend to, I, I, pro, I err on the side of caution with them more than anything. Um, and I tend to keep them at 10 reps for quite a while. Um, I don't mind if they break that up into clusters. I don't necessarily, particularly if they're just learning the movement. But I do keep them at 10 for quite a while. So our guys that are, um, in year 10 now that have just, well, what we were in March, we're seven months in almost, maybe a bit more. Um, with their, a lot of them still working around 10 mark. Yeah. Um, and, and part of that is based on things that I've read about 
the higher volume training and the amount of time that it takes for the connective tissues, the tendons, the ligaments and everything else to respond to resistance training is generally slower than the muscle. So yeah. we want to just make sure that we're given that much time. Um, but we'll start dropping that down. So I mean, beginner phase, I mean, we, we, I think we're generally giving them sort of six months at beginner. Uh, and and maybe, maybe that isn't long enough, I don't know. I don't know if Ben or James has got a perspective on what would constitute. Well, it, it, it's something that we brought up in the lecture about the sort of, um, when you look at those position statements and consensus statements, um, you look at the, the blue and the pink, um, Lloyd and Oliver, uh, youth development model, and how that maps over into beginner, intermediate, experienced and advanced. There's like a, it doesn't seem to fit too well. So I mean, that's that's a fantastic question. It's mm, like where good. does that fit across that uh, Lloyd and Oliver paper? Um, it's, it's it's very difficult to know. The, the probably the best answer is we're not too sure. So getting James' perspective on how he does it is brilliant. So I, I well recommend the, the Dan Baker um, yeah. paper, but also in the, the high performance book. Uh, he's got it's a in there. Yeah, it's he, in there. That's what it's worth it. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's got that all, all in there as well. So it's definitely worth um, yeah, it. That, yeah, that is something we're going to pick up to have in place with our key stage three that will determine whether they they move on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, giving them time <coughs> to get used to those loads, and then we, we look at them closely. We haven't really got many that are working below five, and if they do go below five, it might be for a week or a session, um, and then it isn't generally like a completely maximal effort. It's probably near maximal, and they've got a few reps in the tank, and we're we're holding a couple, a couple back. Um, but again, Dan Baker's chapter is brilliant on that, and and it's opened my eyes in the last few weeks reading that, in terms of his strength progressions, his power progressions. He presents it as a long-term athlete development model. Very, very good. And you know, I hold my hand up with all of this stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. You know, I've been doing it six years, and I'm still learning. I'm still finding things and still got questions. And like James said, that is a brilliant question, and it's a question I don't have a definitive answer to. Um, <clears throat> with kids, I tend to just say, err on the side of caution. Don't expose them to anything like really high intensity too frequently um, and if you're using like a wave rep scheme so you might go um, you know, you've got five three one model where you go five three five three one so you end up doing one set maximally we've adapted it a little bit we might do eight five four or eight five three with them so they get about again that three is probably a, a near maximum effort rather than